would you invest your dollars as Sean, not Sequoia partner, Sean, but just Sean, Sean, uh, or Joel, uh, in, <laughs> I was going to make yeah, as, a, uh, as an LP in like a crypto specific venture fund, like, would you put your money into it? Um, trading firm, probably, you know, I was an algorithm trader in the past and like, but that's a completely different beast. You know, you're yeah, because you're there, you're not betting on the ultimate outcome. Yeah, you're betting on the volatility. You're yeah. On volatility. Yeah. And in terms of crypto funds, like um, I mean, look, I trading is in a different category and it but like it is also a different category of utility. Um I would invest in Paradigm. I think they're really smart. And I would invest in Sequoia because I think we have we're patient and have a long term view on all this stuff, and we're, you know, I well, I, one of the benefits of investing in Sequoia is you get the rest of the portfolio. It's pretty damn good. Uh, I too would invest in Sequoia. Maybe yeah, I'm going to say both of them come out in, in favor of investing in Sequoia, Sean. I, uh, You're like, I, uh, I, uh, Sean, I, would you invest in the uh, in the best performing venture fund in the history of the world over and over? Like, yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I, one really interesting thing you said, and it's funny because I, 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 um, I do think this distinction is very unclear to a lot of people. Is the difference between the like crypto trading and hedge fund types where. They take effectively no opinion on the final outcome. They just trade the volatility and, you know, it's, it's like a money-making machine. On margin at times and sometimes, you know, get, get, get out in front of their skis. But yeah. Well, I don't, oh, yeah. 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 Some do, some don't. People, some do. People them. with zero risk management experience are... Uh... But that's like, to me, it's so interesting because there's a lot of people making money in crypto as LPs in the trading firms that look a lot more like Citadel as a trading group. I was an algorithmic trader at DRW in 2008. And like- Some of my smartest kind of math oriented friends, it's really funny, you talk to them and they're like, yeah, I, trading in crypto is amazing. And then you're like, cool, what use cases are you interested in? They're like, the retail idiots. That's the use case I'm interested in. Cause like I can make a ton of money. I don't know where the yield comes from. You are the yield. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two more things to say that are short points are like one i do think that there is real innovation happening in the space and like all of like those people are often not very quiet actually like like it's the loud get rich quick people that are that are like you hear the most of um but there's real innovation i think like from a computer science perspective it's pretty easy to argue that both bitcoin and ethereum have very interesting properties like from a computer science perspective Ethereum is a shitty distributed computer. It's like... Yeah, it's like a horrible distributed computer. But it works. It works. Yeah, yeah. It's eight orders of magnitude worse than AWS. Like, it's eight orders of magnitude more efficient. I mean, I, I always hear... I, I hear the, like, smart people are building cool stuff. There is cool stuff getting built. I, I, I consistently hear those words. Yeah. Uh, and then I never hear any details that actually are interesting at any scale besides kind of like some examples if you want uh yeah it'd be great i would say there's three things to, like and more but like there's a few things on top on top of ethereum that i've found really interesting so one is a video game called dark forest zk dot gme um created by an mit dropout brilliant math kid, Brian Gu. And it's, first of all, like, it's just really fun to play. For, if you're a hacker, if you're a weird hacker, like it's playing it was the most fun I had had playing a game since like the, the since I first played Counter-Strike and I didn't mention, but I was a professional Counter-Strike player as a kid. Um, and uh, the, the game is like, it literally fully runs on a blockchain. Um, like the whole thing and it's not running on ethereum it'd be way too expensive it's running on a side chain of die a stable coin this thing called x die but the whole game is running on a blockchain so every action you want to take in the game you have to pay a fee like you're you're paying to operate the blockchain another one that i think you'll probably disagree with but with uniswap like i think just what it is is absolutely fascinating like this is a in some sense, it's a company where, and I'm not saying Uniswap, the company, but then Uniswap, the protocol that runs yeah, yeah. 
We actually talked about it. We yeah. talked about it yesterday with a guy, John, who brought it up as like a cool use case. It's like the most, I hate to keep using libertarian, but it is the yeah. most libertarian trading system ever created, which is like, like imagine, crazy. imagine you create a company where like you create a company and you launch it into space or like, you know, like on when we sent like Voyager space probe into the outer atmosphere or sorry, into the like outer solar systems, like you write the software on there and it's just going to go play. Yeah. And just it does its thing. Totally. Forever. And you just swap is out. Like when you ship the code, when you launch the smart contract, this is just a coin vending machine that's going to exist forever. As long as Ethereum exists. Logan, what did he call it? He was like, it's like the biggest gambling house ever created. He had some funny phrase for it. It's a casino that you're launching in the space. Yeah, that's yeah. like never, that, that just cannot, you cannot change the trajectory. You can launch Uniswap v3 or Uniswap v4, or v5, and hope that people will start using that instead of the old ones. But like, this thing is just going to exist forever. And that idea that you can have a, like a business that makes money and like does something, like, I just think that's an insane idea. And you can have the thing spit off cash into a wallet that you own where no one knows who you are in perpetuity. That's not what they did. But I'm just saying, intellectually, it's a really, it's, it's a, it's pretty, uh, there's all sorts of problems with it. But intellectually, it's a pretty fascinating thing. And then the third one is, and, and like, so overhyped. I have so many issues with it, et cetera. But like with NFTs, I do think there's some really interesting properties. Like the idea that an artist, you know, like you have some digital item and you can program in future revenue royalty streams forever. That like, you know, anytime my Van Gogh painting sells, that's it's digital, only the digital copy or whatever, sells like my estate is going to get one percent fee every time it sells forever like that's a i just think that's a fascinating thing and i'm not saying that's a big utility but i'm saying it's a these things really have captivated my imagination and i just think we're so early into all of this and i'm not going to come here and shill any one particular program any one particular thing i think most of it's going to go away most people are idiots but like I do think there's some really interesting innovation there. I want to I want to contrast that little piece with probably I know, I know you didn't do the fundraising, but like what the LP story was for all these crypto funds is like we just described like you know a hundred million dollars of market cap total, uh, and we well, raised and that's what I, uh, That's what I think is interesting in this is is and this is sort of where I struggle is I, I agree with your. It, it, certainly your example of, you know, your wife's family having to deal with that, right? Like that's an amazing utility. And I, I, I don't know how big that is, but, uh, I, you know, it's, it's kind of people that live within authoritarian regimes that have money that are able, you know, whatever. And so we can debate how big that is. And then there's the, there's the wallet as a social identity thing, which I, I'm not totally sure how um, the incentive structure would play out to get there, to get to that state that like people would, but let's say we can get there. That that's, that's great. And then there's the three examples you just, uh, you just laid out, which I think are all super cool. Um, and then there's the idealized state of like what this could all be way in the future. And like, I think that's, uh, it's awesome if there's more checks and balances on government or whatever it is. Like I, I you know, I can imagine all that in between. I think this is where, I struggle is just like how much capital and hype has gone into the ecosystem. It, it's hard for me to foot that with, and it sounds like we're kind of saying similar things that like, Hey, this might not be the biggest market today, uh, but there's some use cases that are either super addicting or super cool, like Uniswap or that game you've played. And then there's other use cases that are maybe small and niche, but super important, right? Which is your wife's family fleeing Iran. And then there's the stuff way in the future that could be, but, you know, it's hard to say how we get from here to there. Is that fair? Yeah, it is fair. And I would just say that, like, look, we raised a $500 million fund when, as Sequoia, we, like, look at the size of funds of sure. individuals. Like, we Your Indonesia like, fund is bigger than, uh, than yeah. that, right? Like, like, we did that intentionally, obviously. We do everything intentionally. Um, that's point one. Point two is, like, we can trade in the fund. And so, you know, like the market cap for trading is very, very large. Um, and then three, I, I think what we're all saying, but I just want to emphasize is like, um, I, I think there's, there's some 
really fascinating experiments being run and some really brilliant people going into the space. And like, as I mentioned early on, like I, I built my first computer when I was seven in 1992. Um, and I just feel the same feelings I had in the early days of computing and internet. And it's like, I don't know what that counts for, but on a 20 year time frame, I think following where really smart people go and where young energy like and enthusiasm goes is oftentimes a pretty good strategy. <laughs> I keep hearing that. I keep hearing them. Well, look at all the young people doing this thing. But like a lot of young people make very dumb decisions at the end of a bull market. Exactly. Right? Like, so, like so, okay, that one bothers exactly. me. We can let's narrow this to IMO gold medalists. Like, let's see where they're going. And IMO gold medalists, it's a very different metric than Harvard HBS grads, where, you know, <laughs> Harvard HBS grads have <laughs> had a, a very different signal than IMO gold medalists. Like, I would say the number one gainer of everything of where IMO gold medalists is going of every sector in the world over the last five years has been crypto. And in particular, and ramp, so by the way, ramp has a, a few. So, so there's, <laughs> yeah, it's Vitalik and then it's yeah. the Woo brothers over the, yeah. And then the subcategory within that is in zero knowledge proofs and something that I like having a PhD in math and physics, and I didn't say, but I have three master's degrees. Like I've had a, I've I started PhD and I've done it in math department. It's like machine learning, statistics, like robotics. Um, we would be talking about these computer science ideas. 15 years ago of like zero knowledge proofs, all, you know, all sorts of like homomorphic encryption, et cetera. And these are kind of been holy grail ideas in computer science. And not only are we now finding applications of these ideas, and I'm not saying they're like commercial applications today, but we're finding actual applications and we're also putting them into production. And it's just incredibly intellectually interesting. And that's attracting literally some of the smartest people in the world from like a math genius perspective. And so let's, instead of saying follow the HBS grads, let's say follow the IMO gold medalists. And I think that's a decent strategy. Well, I, I, and I think we agree, like, listen, there's cool tech here. I don't think anyone would say like, these are very cool, like Uniswap's amazing, right? And the computational problem. And so I, I would never push back and Vitalik seems brilliant. I think the, uh, the concern or the question in all of this is at what cost, both to the dollars that are going in, as well as the other problems that could be solved. And so it's one of those things, it's almost like, what if you're wrong? Like what, why be a cynic here, right? It's it's one of these things that, hey, if it works out, it's great in the future. And oh. that's- So I, I actually like, look, I think it's my job. It's my duty to call bullshit on things. And I have tried to, when I think that something is a scam, like I try to call it out. I mean, it's a shame, honestly, I, I, I was making jokes the entire time while the NFT run up and all that stuff. And people internally can tell you I was definitely a, uh, a cynic on pushing back on some different things. It's a shame that like this kind of manifested itself at a point. I almost wish we were having this discussion uh, six months ago. Yeah. It, it feels like we're yeah. punching down and dancing on the grave a little bit when the market is wh where it is. I, you know? I know. And I, look, I genuinely think the criticism has been good, like Aaron Levy, Moxie. Jack Dorsey, you guys, like, I think the criticism, you, you're 99% right. But I think that there's a real chance that this is a very important trend, like, to, like new technology over the next 30 years. And so it's just, we got to balance. You know, what, balance. by the way, that's, that's what I respect the most about the people that are coming on and having this conversation, because it, it's tough to do this right now. Like it would have been when, when the market was up, it's really hard to do it. And so now I think is the best time to be doing this because let's have a conversation when the bullshit's out and let's yeah. see who genuinely believes in this stuff. And so I guess I, I respect your willingness to come in and, and do this because it's hard. One, it always sounds better uh, to be a cynic than an optimist, right? Just because if there's a 20% chance this works out, then, you know, there's 80% a chance. Yeah, the probability is not in your favor. The probability is yeah. not in your favor. And two, uh, I think this is the right time to be defending this stuff because I know there's a lot of people doubting everything that we're talking about, right? And so I, it feels like hopefully this is becoming an elevated platform for the people that really do believe it. Like, let's convince it. Let's convince the, you know, people that are a little at the margin, right? And 
you know, eventually this we'll find out, right? The market will tell us. 